And we do stand in, in you, Lord, and we, we, uh, we remain obedient to what you want, Lord, and in that we give you the glory in, all of, in everything we do, and we acknowledge you in all that we do, Lord. So, Lord, just, just speak into our lives, Lord, the things that you want us to hear from your word, Lord. Let these seeds be planted deep and, and take root, God. And, Lord, we just love you, Lord, and, um, Lord, just help us to love each other better. In Jesus' name, amen. You want to turn to each other, say hello, and have a seat. Hello. You guys ready for the holidays coming up? Yeah, pretty much. I love Thanksgiving. Anything that involves eating, I'm about it, you know. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, I love, it's about food. Um, well, if you brought your Bibles to the Bible study, turn in them to Matthew chapter 14. If you need one, you can raise your hand and one will be provided for you, if you're good. Um, well, we've been going through Matthew, and as we've been going through, I, I've titled this uh, series, going through Matthew, Be Disciples. You know, it's kind of the whole Beatitudes. You can think of, when you think of be disciples, you think of the Beatitudes, and you think of what Jesus commanded, um, to be disciples and make disciples. And as we go, we, we, we incorporate other areas in the Bible, or at the very least, I think it's, be, it's being put up there, um, where, wherever we are in Matthew, it'll, it'll show the synoptic, synoptic version of that, the synoptic gospels being Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And as you guys heard time and time again, synoptic means seen together. It's a uh, theological word for that. But, uh, but it's good as we go through. You get different perspectives. You get the whole picture of what ha- different perspectives of, perspectives of what happened. And so we, we go through that, but we're going through Matthew. And uh, and as we, as we go through Matthew, we, we, we're, getting, we're getting Matthew's calculated mind. You get the way, Ma- the way Matthew thinks. He's very number-oriented. He likes, he likes to have numbers at the end of his, his pages. He was a tax collector. And, uh, and as we're getting this, this account from Matthew, we see that Jesus has started his ministry. He's doing these wonderful teachings. He's gathering people to him. Yet at the very least, he gather, he's gathered these 12 apostles to him. And as he's going, we see at this time, as we saw last week, Things are kind of happening that are towards the negative. You see, he was rejected at Nazareth. And then as we get into chapter 14, we see that his cousin John was beheaded. And you know, that, that, I think as, as we go through that, that could be a pretty hard thing to deal with if you're in ministry. You know, if, if I showed up here and you guys were like, no, forget that. Sean's, we just can't listen to that guy. You know, and uh, that'd be pretty hard to take, you know. And, uh, and then being rejected, and then if I go and then I find out someone I'm close to got their heads cut off, I might be like, you know, I'm going to need a couple weeks before I get back to ministry. But we see what Jesus did. He, he continued on. Well, let's read about it because, the, you know, the Bible's a lot better than I am. Matthew chapter 14, at the time, Herod the Tetrarch um, had heard the reports of Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitudes because they they counted him a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, "Give Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of, an o- because of the oath, oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he, so he sent and, and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. And we're, we're learning about Herod the Tetrarch, and literally, um, Tetrarch means ruler of a fourth part. Remember, 
his dad is Herod the Great. At the beginning of all this, you had Herod the Great who got his position of power because his dad, um, his dad backed the right Caesar. And so Caesar, when Caesar took control, he, he hooked up Herod with the power. Well, then once Herod the Great died, the, the current Caesar of that time, he didn't, want, he didn't want all the power to be just in one person. So he decided, dealing with all these kids, you know, the, you know the, like, like father, like sons, you know, Herod the Great had killed, even killed some of his sons to keep power. And you see, that's, that's the mentality of these, of these individuals, by the way, of these rulers of Israel at this time of, of Herod was, was very um, holding on to everything, especially as they seem to be losing power. The tendency for these men is to hold on to, the pow- to power. And, uh, and they're kind of like their dad in that. And, 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 and I think maybe Caesar might have saw that. And so he splits it up into four parts. But uh, we see here, as he's, as he's ruling, he wasn't, he wasn't quite even a king. He was, he was, he was more, I don't know, the, more of the, the ruler of this area. King was kind of a title that was put upon him. And I'm sure he wanted to be recognized as a king. But that was put on him. In fact, uh, Rome even instituted one of their own into that. We know, we know that's Pontius Pilate that ruled one section of Israel. But this, the way Herod's mind was, this was kind of warped, or he was kind of warped in that he kept on going back to Caesar to ask for power. And eventually this led to Herod's um, demise, and he was banished to Gaul, uh, history says. And we see there's a, there's a lot of things going on with Herod and I think we can kind of relate to, or at least I know I can relate to Herod a little bit in, in this, in, in Sean, the, 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 the flesh, or Sean, the sinner. Because it seems that, that Herod, I don't know, I was talking to my dad, I don't know really how to put it, except that, that Herod seemed to have an aspect to want to be better. Or that Herod had, had an aspect of holy, not holiness per se of him, but, but maybe he had some kind of moral structure to him. And I think we may be, either we can, re- if you're like me, you can relate to that, where it's like you know the difference. You know, you know, you know the differences between right and wrong. Or maybe you go to church and there's, this, there's, there's an actual teacher who's really good, and you go to him and you listen to him, but then you go and you behave in these, these in, uh, sinful manners, or you have a certain sin. I'm not saying any of you guys do this. I hope not. But, you know, you have these issues or these sins that you're allowing into your life, or you you know you say you're you say you're born again, but maybe you know out in the world no one would be able to tell the difference. But we see Herod in a position of power here, and 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 you see the things that he's led. He's he's stolen his his brother's wife. Now I don't know what things were like in regards to that two thousand years ago, but if I had a brother and he stole my wife now, I'd be very upset about it. You know, and if. And I can, and, you know, I, I can tell you, it was, it was an issue. When I was looking, when I was looking into it, it, it may have been just a, um, a civilian type brother, even. It might not have been a ruler, um, or it was his brother Philip who ruled to the south. Either way, it's, it's evil. And then what happens? And you could see, and, and, and as I'm studying this, I see it because it seemed like that John, that uh, that John was having some kind of effect on this Herod. Because at first he wanted to kill him because he was, you know, he was talking smack about him. And he's saying, you can't do that. That's unlawful. And so he wanted to kill him, but he knew better because the people were flocking to John. Remember, millions of people at this time were going out to see John in the wilderness baptize people and, and teach the message of repentance. And it's one of those things, you know, if, if you're on fire for the Lord, the people will travel for miles to watch you burn, you know. And that's kind of that's what I think, I immediately think of John when I think of that saying. And as he's doing that, people were going, and it was because it was, well, it was, actually, it was kind of something new for that time. You know, with baptisms in, in the Jewish culture, it was meant to apostas, apostatize people. It was meant to take non-Jews into the Jewish religion and culture. And they, they, would, have to go and, and, and they would have to go and get baptized. But they even wanted uh, these people, the um, people trying to become Jewish or trying to follow the Jewish religion, the, um, no one went out there and grabbed them and dunked them. They didn't, t- because Gentiles weren't clean, right? They had to do it themselves. So now you have John... Um, the Baptist who's practicing this, and he's going out and, and giving the repentance of uh, giving the message of repentance, be washed clean of your sins, you know. And as, as he's, and this is something no one's ever really seen before. In fact, this is part of the reason why we believe that John was in uh, a scene 
because uh, of all the water and the washing and stuff. And so, you know, I imagine, like, so I, know, I know a few men in my life who don't have that, I don't, I don't know if you want to call it a holy filter, but they don't have, like, that filter in their heads where they probably shouldn't call this out at that certain time, you know. You're a dirty sinner, you know. But, you know, or, or just, you know, that tact, if you want to call it that. I know some people like that. And one, it's funny because, like, one, one person that immediately comes to my mind is, is this missionary in Mexicali named John Barilero. Those of you who know him, you know exactly what I'm saying. He'll, he'll say things like, he, so this, this had a huge impact on my life. And I always, whenever I think of John the Baptist, maybe it's because they share the same name and I'm just kind of dumb that way. But like, whenever, whenever, uh, whenever I think of John the Baptist, I think of John Barilero. Like, I think they have the same spirit. Because this is why, because he would, uh, when, when, before they were missionaries in Mexico, we'd always go to the Barilero's home. And, uh, and John and Lori taught me um, in second grade, when we first started going to the church, they were my, they were my uh, second grade teachers. And in that too, by the way, I know scripture from second grade from those men, from John and Lori. So pour into your kids, a little side note there. Pour into your children, bring them to church. Um, but uh, we would go, and, and so we would hang out all the time with John and Lori Barilero. And, and I, I remember this, John, would come, John and Lori would come over, and John would say, hey, I, we got to go get some uh, you know, tortillas for dinner. Do you, you want to go with me? And I just always wanted to hang out. Like, all right, sweet, let's go. And so we'd get in the car, and we'd go down to Food for Less. And every single time, remember, John doesn't have that, that you know, maybe I shouldn't go do this. He had a boldness about him. He would walk up and full on just start, like, evangelizing to somebody. And so I imagine John the Baptist was very much the same way. You know, if, if I'm about, if I'm indeed, if I indeed believe in the kingdom of God, and I am chosen, and God wants me to make disciples, and God wants me to go out, then I need to be about, be doing this. You know, and then I think as, as believers, especially in the United States, or in our communities, or whatever, you know, we want to be tactful, we want to present the gospel in a way that, you know, this is my life, you know, but look, I could still live, live life a certain way, or whatever, you know, and you, you, you know, we, you'd, you'd probably walk away from me if we were walking down a, mis, uh, a busy street and I just turned around and said, repent or die and burn in hell. You know, you guys are like, okay, I'm out of here, you know. I'll pray for you over there. You know, but I see that, and, and like, and, and that's always stuck, because I remember no one ever, no one ever turned to John Barilero, and I think it must have been like four or five times that he, it was every time I went with him, by the way, but every time, he was always ended up praying with these people. And they always responded to it. I have never once, in, in, in times that I've, bold, you know, in, in my boldness, gone up to somebody and decided, I've never once had them, like, yell in my face. I mean, yet. Or, or punch me. Or kill me. Praise God. But, you know, that's never happened. But anyway, I think of that, and I think, I think this is John the Baptist, is he just didn't care. And I think a big reason why John the Baptist and Barilero didn't care is because of what they believe. John the Baptist believing, believing his cousin is Messiah. You know, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world when Jesus came to get, was walking up to where John was. And so John, not caring, will say anything. Because you know what I think? I think, it's, and this, is, this is probably Sean here, but I think when, when John got arrested, he was sitting in prison going, it's fine with me. Messiah's here, baby. I'm getting out, dog. You know, like, what are you going to do? You know, and, 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 and even while, while John's sitting there, he's probably kind of getting a little, little, maybe a little worried and to the point where he's like, all right, go, go ask Messiah what's going on here. You know, when is he going to let me out? Because, you know, the scriptures say that Messiah's going to break all chains. <laughs> I'm in him, you know. And so, and so he, I think that's partially where his boldness comes from. Little, well, John knows now, you know, his chains were broken. He's in the presence of God, hanging out with his cousin in heaven. Lucky John, right? Bless John. But, um, but he, you see that that got him in trouble. But I, lo- I love John the Baptist for this because it's, 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 a, it's a fire that I want, or it's a boldness that I want to speak the gospel when I see an area or, or an aspect in life where it needs to be spoken. And how often has the Holy Spirit prompted you? And I'm not, trust me, I'm, I'm, I promise you, I'm not saying, like, go out and start beating people over the head with the Bible. Especially, literally. You will get arrested. But, but those times where the Holy Spirit's prompting you to go talk to that person. Go, go pray, go ask that person if they want prayer. Well, God, you know, if they ask me for prayer, then I'll know it's from you. 
God's like, no, I'm telling you, that's how you know it's from me. God's never going to be like, no, hey, Sean, no, don't pray for that person. You know? And you know what? Again, in that too, I've never had anyone go, no, thanks. Especially unbelievers. Especially unbelievers that are kind of annoyed that I'm a believer. When you because then when they say, well, you know, can I pray for you? They go, yeah. I mean, I know, I realize, I'm, I'm not trying to be naive. I realize some people might be like, no, you know, I don't believe in God. Or, but a lot of times they'll, they'll think it's like a good luck thing. Literally, they know you're working the soil, you know, you're, you're planting the seeds that's having an effect in their lives. And so we pour into it, and that's how you work the soil, like we were talking about um, before this, is, is the soils that, you know, we're, we're not called to, be, to, to specifically um, plant the seeds only in certain locations, right? Jesus, is, uh, Jesus points out this, the, um, the sower, he's, not, he's, he's throwing them out. Some hit the road, that's where they land. Some hit the, the, um, the rocky soil, then that's where it lands too. Go put the seeds there regardless. It's not up to you where you're going to plant the seeds. In fact, God may be telling you, go plant it in the rocky soil. Well, God, it's the rocky soil. It's going to sprout and then it's going to die up. So that's not up to you. Go plant those seeds and then work the soil because I'm going to do a work. And so John's working the soil of this situation. John's speaking out against his local government here, saying what you are, and it's not, you know, it's, it's nothing to do with sins. He's not going up because Herod's a, a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent, and, you know, and John happens to be a whatever other thing there is. You know, he's going up because he's seeing something wrong. He's seeing something immoral. It's sin. And John's addressing the sin, saying, this is not lawful for you to do this. Herod wanting to kill him, but then I think as you see here, and it says, um, it says in verse uh, 9 or 8, where am I? I'm sorry. Um, but verse 8 and 9, he says he was sorry that he had to do that. He was sorry that he had, because he, you know, he wanted to keep his word. And you see, you know, you see, I, you see that there was, there was a development being worked between John the Baptist and Herod. And that's kind of interesting to me, because one of the most powerful men in Israel Against, against uh, you know, well, I, I guess John was powerful in the fact that the people believed him to be a prophet. We know he was, but believed him to be a prophet. So he had the influence of people, but that was probably dying out as Jesus was coming up. And, you, and my, my point in this is that you see there was a relationship happening between John and Herod. And that should also give you, some, give you guys some courage and some boldness. If, if God's calling you to, to specifically and boldly speak into somebody's life that maybe they're, I don't know, an atheist, or they don't, they don't care, or they don't know what they believe, or there's some cult, that we, then you need to go speak. Because look, even with John and Herod, there was a relationship being built. And it was having, it was, it was having an effect. In fact, he was sorry that he had to do it. I think any other person that called out even a popular person that may have called out Herod, Herod would have not thought twice about it. <laughs> okay, off with your head, you know, I don't want to hear it anymore. But that's how these seeds are planted, right? It's, it's the goodness of God. I was, I was talking to Lindsay on the way here, and I was, I was saying, you know, it's, it's crazy that it's, it literally, I can't think of, how did, I, how did I word it? Everything good that I have is literally from God. Everything. Like, there's, there's nothing, like, good that I can, I can, you know, and if I followed to where the origin, it, it was, like, from Satan or something, you know, like, or just kind of passively not from anything. Literally everything I get, my family, this, you know, the church, everywhere I'm at in life, I mean, you know, the things, things financially that I have, everything that's good was, has been from, uh, Lindsay, has been from God. I was going to say that, and then I left my mind. And then, you know, and so in that, people want to see that, and I think John, I wonder, I, I can't help but wonder in my Seanisms here, is, is how many late night conversations did Herod and John have as they were building that re relation? And, and wouldn't it have been awesome if, we're going to play the if game, if we read that Herod repented and did the right thing and promoted holiness in his government and, and pursued the, you know, the Messiah and all this stuff, but, but you know, sadly, no, that's not the case. That didn't happen. John lost his head. John was... Um, persecuted. John, John went to death for what he believed. And uh, we see why. And I think as we look at this, we see a perversion that sin is in the life of Herod. Because he, he, he stole, he commits adultery. He steals his brother's wife. And then, and then like he goes from that to lusting after his niece. That's messed up. 
Like, that's messed up. Like, they say, they say, like, things are getting worse. That's pretty messed up for 2,000 years ago. Like, if, if I, you know, if, if that happened here, or I mean, just, you know, in Ontario or, you know, in the United States, even, or whatever it makes the news, like, if, let's say whoever's in power now, that, that, that comes out. That's like impeachable stuff, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying that's like, that's going to be blasted on the news. That's kind of disgusting. But we see how the mind of Herod is that he had a mind of sin. He was a man of the flesh. And, and ultimately, that's the, that's the road, that's the choice, and that's the avenue he chose to, um, he chose to go down. And so the disciples come in verse 12, and they, and they came and they took away the body and they buried it, and they went and told Jesus. And you know, it, Jesus already being rejected, and, the, and Jesus having to deal with the scribes and the Pharisees, and whoever else didn't, was kind of against him and what's going on. Jesus is already kind of having, it seems, a rough week. You know, and it, and it, can, it can get kind of overwhelming. And, he, you know, and keep in mind, he had sent out his, his, his inner circle to do stuff. They were going out and doing works, and they had, at this point, they're just coming back. And so this is, well, let's read it. This is what Jesus reacts. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard of it, they heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place. Uh, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into a village and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have only five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them here to me. And he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass, and he took five loaves and two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And when they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who have eaten were about five thousand men, besides the women and besides the children. And it's, I, I like the, like, I like the picture of what's going on. It's, it's, uh, it's the human Jesus here, fully God, but fully human, is going through a pretty, like, as far as hard time levels, you know, I'm, I'm sure not everyone's super tight with their cousins, you know, like, necessarily, but, I mean, I'm sure there are, too, right? You know, or, or, you know, or people that are that close, you know, maybe you've grown up with them, or maybe even a rel- uh, relative such as a sister or a parent or something, or a child, God forbid, you know, and, and, spe- and as you're in ministry and, and something like that happens, our tendency could be to, to, to kind of pull away or kind of regroup. And, and, and keep in mind, I don't mean to be insensitive. In fact, I don't want to be insensitive because I can't begin to know except for my grandfather who passed away. But um, I was, you know, I was, a, I was a, what, a junior or senior in high school. And I can't even begin to imagine what that's like, but you see the heart of God and, and who he is, and his, his great compassion. And, and, and in that, as we continue and we move on in this life, it makes, you, you know, it makes me think of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because as we're, as we're going through this life and as we're doing these things, these things are going to happen. And I would ask you, born again believer, is where is your mind at? Are you eternally minded? You know, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Yeah, we, we, you know, death is, you know, we could sugarcoat death, I think. We can call, you know, funerals, celebrations of life, and I get it, and I like it, and that's, you know, great, you know, awesome. A born again believer, that's, that's, it's, it is beautiful, but it's, it's bittersweet, right? I mean, that, it says, oh, death, where is your sting? Because you know what, guess what? Death has a sting. And these things can come up, and these things can happen, but we put on the whole armor of God, and, 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 we, and, and we pursue because we're eternally minded. And we know that one day, yet my flesh be destroyed, yet with my eyes I will see God. That, you know, maybe I live another, you know, 40, 50, 60 years or whatever. But I'm going to live forever. And I would ask you, are you eternally minded? Because I think one of the big reasons, you know, obviously God being God here, can, you, know, you know, he... One of the big reasons is that he keeps pursuing wasn't just because he was trying to bury himself in the ministry or bury himself in his job and this, well, this is what I do. I'll just work harder so I won't think about my dead cousin. 
No, it's because he knew where John was. He knew, well, he knew, you know, because he's God, but he knew where John, he knew John was okay, even though, you know, he's headless. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. But, you know, he knew John, he knew where John was. And again, I don't, I don't, I don't want to take anything away from any one of you that have suffered relatives passing. But isn't it bring you joy to know that, you, like, yeah, you're, you, you're going to suffer, and it is suffering. You're going to suffer X amount of years without him until one day you're in the presence with God, and you're going to get eternity with these people. Be eternally minded, because that's why Jesus continued. That's why Jesus got up and, 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 and you know, and because the great compassion he had on these people, that's why he continued to move forward. Because he knew where John was. You know, and that's, and he wanted, he wanted this for the, all these people. That's why he met their every need. That's why he healed them with no problem. Because he wanted the sea to be into these people's hearts when he died and he rose again, that they would go back and, and, and realize God walked among us and fed us. God walked among us and healed my leprosy. And no, like, this is, I mean, his cousin had just died. This is the son of Mary. And it turned out to be God. I'm going to believe in him. And Jesus said in the example, Jesus pressing forward when it gets hard. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. I have a quote here from John Calvin. He died for us, that we might die to ourselves. I mean, that's, you know, as, as we go and we get baptized, we get baptized, right? And it's, it, it's like we're, you know, we're dying, we're dying to ourselves, we're in the ground, and we're coming up new. And that's the whole thing. We're, we're dying and we're reborn. We're born again and we're born again in love. And, we, like, and the men's, and I, I bring this up because I just did the men's small group yesterday, so it's fresh on my mind. But, you know, 2 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 4, and it talks about the boldness that we have as believers. And that boldness, like John the Baptist or like John Barilero, you know, that boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit, from the spirit of salvation because of what Jesus did for us. Um, Paul's saying we have that boldness and we go and we proclaim it to other people. We move in that. People should look at our lives and see the light. People should look at us and know and taste the quality of, of the believer that we are, which is in Jesus Christ. Jesus says we are salt of the earth. We bring flavor there, there, there's, there's, there's an attraction to this. You have value as a born-again believer. You have value as an unbeliever because Jesus came to die for you. Now, in and of yourself, you don't do anything. In and of yourself, your, your works are like filthy rags. And, you know, I'm not, don't, don't leave here being like, oh, I'm pretty awesome. You know, this is great. Like, I like Sean, you know. But, but understand that you have value in, the, in that God Almighty saw it fit to become a human being to pull you out of hell. And in that motivation, we have that boldness and we move in what God has for us despite the things that are going to happen. And we move forward just like Jesus did here. Jesus setting the example and, and moving in that, knowing that he's going to see his family again. I mean, he's separated from God. Jesus, all, we're going to read it, we're going to read it here, I think, that Jesus all the time uh, would go to pray. And keep in mind why he did that. You, like I say, you know one way I really understand the Trinity? Not that I understand the Trinity fully. You know, I, I could not sit here and, and just absolutely explain it. Which, by the way, I kind of like my God like that. You know what I mean? Like, if, if I could fully, absolutely, 100% say, okay, let me tell you how God, and why God, and everything about God, I, then I, would that be God? You know what I mean? Like, I like that God's, there's aspects of God that is unexplainable. But you know what the, the, the things I can't explain in the Trinity is the family love relationship of him. And, I, and I, I believe I have that on lockdown. I believe I know that with all my heart that I can show that to other people because, you know, I've seen it, that I've seen the unbeliever be attracted to the goodness of God. I've seen it. It, it turns out the Bible's right. You know, and I've seen them attracted because people are, de people, I don't, you know, th this whole entire time, what have people been um, desiring is, is family and love and, and security and, 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 the, and that, that bondship with each other. But man's sin has wrecked all that. And I see that in that. And so we, we yeah, we die to ourselves, but we're, we are more than conquerors after that death because we're resurrected in Jesus. That's why, we, you know, we, we, put, we, don't, we don't put on a, um, a worn armor. We don't put on a dull, we don't swing a dull sword. 
It's sharper than any two-edged sword. We're able to hold out the fiery um, darts of the enemy. I don't believe there's a backplate on it. We head on for, um, rush the enemy in this. And you know what, this is, and as we move in this grace and we move in this love, it's not, it's not a, um, it's not an excuse to sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? It says in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How else, shall, how else we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And I, I printed out the King James here. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, and, um, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. Problem, and then my notes, problem with, with a sin, problem with the flesh, fast. Pray, give it to God. I've had to do that multiple times. Because you know what, fasting, it's, it's not, God's not going to look at you. What do you, wait, what do you want? Oh, you want a new car? Okay, you're fasting about it? Well, then I'll hear you better. You know, you're laughing because it's ridiculous, right? God doesn't, God, when you're hungry, he doesn't open God's ears more. But what is, what is, and I've said this before, what does fasting do? Fasting helps you fight the flesh. Because, you know, as you, as, say you take, say you're just, like, if I fast lunch, in my head, it's a big deal, you know, but... Like, if, say you're, as you're fasting, say you fast a day, say you're super holy, like, not like me, and you fast a day, you know, as you're going and your body's, your body's kind of looking at you, going, hmm, hmm, what are you doing? I'm hungry, feed me, you, you know, stupid person. <laughs> you know, as, as, as that's happening, then you're like, no, I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm, being fill, I'm filling my spirit, and you're fighting your flesh, so that as you do that, say you do that for a day, a week, maybe you go crazy and you do it for 30 days, I don't know, do whatever you want, do what God's telling you to do, be careful too, I know people have diabetes, and you know, please don't kill yourself, but um, as you do that and you fight and you, and you, and you fast, you know what you're doing? You're, you're fighting your flesh so that when sin, things, sem, sin temptations do arise in your life, you're a little bit stronger in that, are you not? Because you've been feeding your spirit. You've been denying your flesh and you've been feeding your spirit. And as, as these things come on that, you know, that it's hard, to, it's hard to resist the temptation and it's hard to walk in that newness of life, well, fast. And then pray. Be in the Word. And you know what else? Confess to whomever you're discipling. And I'm speaking to you that are, that are discipling somebody now. Because the person that's being discipled, this should be second nature in that you should be telling them what's going on in your life. You're right? Because you, you, know, you want the student or whatever, the, the disciplee, if that's a word, to tell the discipler, hey, you know, this is what I struggle with. So that should be, he, you know, you're, if you're discipling, you should be asking the disciplee that all the time. What's going on? How's that thing that you struggle with? Man, I fell a couple times. Oh, only four? That's awesome, dude. Let's pray. Oh, five times this time? Mm-hmm. Let's pray anyway. You know? But, but you know that discipleship? I think it works two ways. It's a two-way street. You know, hey, man, I, hey, you know, person that I disciple, I struggle with this too. I can relate to you on that because I struggle with that. We confess our sins to one another. Ironing, sharpening iron. We, we're not in this alone. We have the Lord Jesus, but we also have each other. And so I think we, 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 we confess those things and we move in with each other. And that's what Jesus was doing here. Because um, first of all, the, the, all the apostles had, come back, had just come back from doing these wonderful things. And now I think they, you know, if, if they're anything like me, they're tired and hungry. And if, if they don't eat, then, well, they might die. Or at least that's what I think when I'm super hungry. I'm probably going to die. I always joke with Lindsay, I go, I'm starving to death. And she just rolls her eyes at me. It's very mean. But, um, <laughs> but what does Jesus respond to that? He, he, he says, you feed them. You know why? Because they were just out there doing these crazy miracles. And now they're back, and Jesus is saying, we don't need to send them away. Did you not learn anything when you're out there? You know, you know like healing leprosy? You know, and, and, he's, and, he's, and, and so the, he, he wants to see them do something here, but... Obviously, they kind of missed it, but he feeds them, and, he, and, he, and despite all these things happening to Jesus, he takes the bread, and he immediately goes to his heavenly Father, and he thanks him for the bread, and he makes like enough bread to feed, at the very least, 5,000 men that we know of, because that's what the Bible says. There's obviously women and children there, and so you could, I, I guess, I don't know, double it maybe, so 10,000 people. 
you know, and, th- and that's crazy. They just uncovered a, um, a 500-year-old, a- 580-year-old dis- uh, depiction of artwork in Israel or something like that of, um, of that story. And you know what I like about that is there, there's nothing written back then disputing the story. And that should say something in your head, you, you, those of you that are kind of interested in apologetics and stuff, is that's, that's almost overwhelming evidence to s- suggest that this actually happened. That God actually walked this earth and, f- and, and fed 5,000 people. I'm using my iPad instead of paper notes here, so bear with me if I'm a little like off or anything, or if it's kind of weird. But uh, but you see, I think I think I think the apostles they kind of wanted to get away, and and if they're anything like me here, they were looking at the opportunity, noticing that everyone's hungry. You know, it's like hey, you know, let's go tell the Lord, like hey, they gotta go eat, you know, because I I kind of want to like just relax and chill with you guys, you know. And it must be, it must have been kind of, again, if they're like me, it must have been kind of frustrating when, like, no, you feed them. <laughs> oh, God, come on. Let them go eat to their houses. And, you know, the, and so I could see, and obviously Jesus being Jesus wasn't being naive. He knew what they were doing. You know, I picture my head. And then what happens? They, a great work happens. They fed, they fed 5,000 people. Well, then right after that, you see immediately in verse 22, Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. And the, 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 the super theological pastor, pastoral Bible teacher thing to say is, obviously pray, look, Jesus did it. Okay, so we know that, right? We, we all agree that, yeah, Jesus prayed, so we ought to pray too. You know, the son prayed to the father. But think about that, like I was saying about the Trinity, about, about the son's relationship to the father. Jesus, for up until the point of being born on earth, had instant access to his, to his dad, to, his father, to, to God. Jesus sitting there on his throne just would have been like, hey, heavenly father, you know, I don't know how he addressed it, but, you know, father. And, and they had dialogue, real conversation, real fellowship now he's on earth. Guys, it, was, it wasn't just that Jesus did this because he needed the strength, although he prayed because Jesus needed the strength. It wasn't just Jesus did that because he wanted to see God move, although Jesus did want to see God move. Jesus was praying because it was, it, it was second nature for him to talk to his dad, for him to talk to his father. And I don't mean, I'm not trying to cheapen God and calling him dad or anything, but like it was, it was, it's, it was natural for all for Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, to want to talk to his Father. And i got to ask you in that, is that something natural to you? Do you go to God and pray for everything and that's going on in your life? Maybe there's something going, maybe as I'm t- talking about somebody that's passed away, maybe that's real because someone just passed away. And maybe, maybe as that person was sick or maybe you just didn't know, was your first instinct to pray? Maybe as, you, as we're reading, and I'm not going to get too deep into this, but all these crazy things that are going on with, in our government. Is your first instinct to, to slam it? Is your first instinct to pray? Whatever's happening, I think our immediate reaction should be to pray. Because God says, come, you're born again, you can come boldly into the throne room of grace. You know why? Because you are Christ-like. Because, Jesus looked, because God looks at you like he looks at his son, who for eternity was sitting right there talking to him. So now we can enter in the the throne room of grace. Now our prayers are directly heard. We have the ear of God, whether we're hungry or not. I mean, still fast, but like whether, whatever, we, we can talk to the Father. And then we sit around, we wonder what's going on, we wonder what to do. And it's, I was, again, I was talking to Lindsay about this, it was like something was going on, and I was like, I wonder if God is okay with this. And, and God was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and I'm just like, huh? You know, but when, when we're in that, in that prayer, when that's your first reaction, man, I think that's, that's, that's the relationship that Jesus had. And, 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 I, and I know because that's been my example with my, with my parents. More specifically, my mom is like that. And sometimes it's like, 
It's like, I, I think in my head, I'm not going to tell my mom about this because all I, n- I know what she's going to say. Well, let's pray. And I'll sit there getting kind of annoyed, like, I want to pray. Because I'm a human. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Set the phone down. No, but... But... Because that's my mom's natural reaction. And that was Jesus' natural reaction. And I guarantee you, if, you were, if Jesus appeared before you and said, what's your problem? And you're like, Lord, Lord, this, this is my problem. This is my problem. And you'd be looking at Jesus telling him, I guarantee you with everything in my being, Jesus would say, let's pray. Pray, guys. Pray, pray without ceasing. Pray all the time. Whatever's happening, pray. Lift, lift it up to God. Because that's... that's Jesus, again, once again, everything he was going through, he prayed. Moving on, verse 24, But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was, con- was contrary. Um, if, you've, if you've ever been to Israel, or if you've ever been to church and heard about you know, the Sea of Galilee, it doesn't look very intimidating, right, I think? From what, I, from, what I, from what I hear from every other pastor, because I haven't been yet, the sea, okay, one day I'm going to go to Israel and I'm going to come back and be like, well, let me tell you, I'm an expert. But, but uh, the, the Sea of Galilee, it, it doesn't look all that intimidating until you're out there and the wind starts picking up. And that's the stories I've heard is, is people will even be on the boat kind of looking like, what? so what? I'll just, I'll just go in the water and swim to shore. It's right there. But then the way the, way the weather is and the way the, the crosswinds and stuff and all these things that I'm not going to even pretend like I know, happen, it gets pretty dangerous out there. And so you can imagine, these aren't just guys that, you know, it's not a bunch of 12 men that Jesus picked that were like all, you know, bureaucrats. Or they weren't all like, you know, there's there's a good majority of them that are sailors. A good majority of them should, you know, they, 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 they're probably strictly out there. They probably saw the signs, although the winds can pick up at a moment's notice, but they may have saw the signs that it was going to be bad. And the only reason they did it was because, you know, you know our master who just fed 5,000 people commanded us to do it. And they're out there. But then it starts getting rough. Now the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out of fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. That must have been, I mean, think about that, the reality of that. Like, if this is all water, and you see, you know, someone coming to you on the water, and, and you had to think, the water was, it wasn't like flat, right? It was like, it was, it was kind of going. I wonder if Jesus was like, you know, he's going up and down in this water. I don't know, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And as that's happening, that must have been, that absolutely, that would scare me because you got to think, yeah, they've been seeing healings, right? They may have even saw the dead rise. They've seen five, they've seen like 10,000 people get fed and they had, they had stuff left over. Well, that might not have been in their stomachs very long in that sea, right? But uh, I don't know why that was necessary to point out. But man, that would freak you out if you saw Jesus, you saw anybody walking on water. Like, think about that in your head. Like, no, 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 that's not true. No way. I'm not seeing this. But you see, you see Christ immediately, knowing that's probably what the thing is. Relax. It's actually me. And then this is why I absolutely, like, I, I think I told you last week, the week before, I relate to the worst people. I relate to Herod. I relate to the worst people in the Bible. I relate to Balaam. Balaam heard from God, was a prophet. God would speak to him, and he used it to manipulate Saul, Saul, Saul was put in a position, a powerful position by God, and Saul blew it, and God, he, he didn't even have that relationship. He would talk to um, Elijah, uh, not Elijah, he would talk to Samuel and, and, and say, you're God. But, but I, rela- I relate to Simon Peter a lot. Mainly I relate to Simon Peter because he always says the worst possible wrong thing. But he always says the worst possible wrong thing in the presence of his God. And he was corrected. And then, and then if you can go and you can read, you know, First Peter. But I relate to Simon because this is Peter's logic. And I like to take Peter's name out in my head and put Sean because this is exactly how I would think. In fact, I was, I was looking up commentaries and, and, it, and a, lot of com- a lot of the commentaries can't fathom why Peter's brain went to this. But man, as I read this, I completely get it because this is exactly, I would have monopolized on this moment with all my heart. Let's just read it wherever I'm at. 
And then when the disciples saw him walking in the sea, they were scared as a ghost. Okay, verse 20. And Peter, or Sean, no, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, the rest of the story, I'll read it, but the rest of the story, Jesus, uh, Peter fails and he gets dunked because, you know, Peter's a lot like his, I'm, I'm sure if you looked up my DNA, I'm probably related to Peter. And he failed, and, he, and he, you see he fell, and Jesus had to take his hand and bring him up. But man, for, you know, and, and say whatever you want, Peter lived the rest of his natural life walking on water. Walking on water. No one, no one ever except God, no one ever can boast that. You know what, you know, they like, and no one disputed that. Because if that didn't happen, I guarantee you Matthew, the other apostle, would have been like, no, he didn't. Don't listen to that garbage. He's always lies. You know, but that's something he could tell people. Look, what if that's your testimony straight up? What if that's the testimony you have as a born again believer? Well, yeah, I had this amazing um, experience with the Lord where he made me born again. And then, you know, he's, he's poured in my life. I was baptized. I was sealed in the Holy Spirit. And then I walked on water. <laughs> like, you're laughing because you're, you're right there with me. Like, you know what I'm saying. Like, that's insane to think about. And he could go and tell people, Yeah. I walked on water. Like seriously, if I was a brand new believer back then, I would have been, I would have gone to a lake, looked around, you know, and tried to do it. But he could boast that. He walked on water. And, and I know that like, the, again, the pastoral thing is like, we can walk on water in our lives. We have to just keep our eyes on Jesus. And it was, well, let's just read it before I get carried away here. And when Jesus saw, um, and when he, Peter, saw that the wind was uh, boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, um, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were on the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Jesus was like, I know, no. But that's crazy. And I like this. It says little faith. Little faith is often found in places where we might expect great faith. Little faith is far too eager for signs. Little faith is apt to have too high an opinion of its own power. Little faith is too much affected by its surroundings. Little faith is too quick to exaggerate the plural. But also, little faith, little faith is true faith. Notice how Jesus didn't say, oh, you have no faith. Peter had a little bit of faith in him in that. Because that's why I like to think I would have, because, you know, I'll just say, it, I guarantee you I would have been like, Lord, can I come out too? I promise you with everything in me, I would have like ran and done this knee slide on the water. But like, but, but that, that little faith is, is, I love Peter's logic. And it, it wasn't like, and, and I know it says, if it's you, command me. The language in there is, since it's you, because it's you, command me to come out. Little faith is true faith. Little faith will obey the words of Jesus. Little faith struggles to come to Jesus. Little faith will accomplish great things for a time. Little faith will pray when it is in trouble. Remember, is that your natural reaction? You, we should be so prayer-minded, prayer-like-minded, that, that no matter what, good, bad, ugly, no matter what the scenario is like in our life, we pray. That's the, that's, when you have that, that's little faith. And that comes by reading the Word of God. Little faith will pray when it's in trouble. Little faith is safe because Jesus is near. That gives me chills, I'm sorry. But that's, I just love that. I love that story. I love that, that God, and keep in mind, this is Jesus. Everything, even now, everything is subjected to the very voice of God, right? Jesus created everything. He said, let there be the Sea of Galilee. And there was, and it was good. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's all, it all belongs. The, the cross that Jesus hung on was at one point created by him. So of course he can walk on the water. And guys, he, he wants to do great things. And, all, you know, all we start is, is reading the word, and that's how your faith grows. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And then we, we take the little faith, and I, you know what I think those great things, especially to Calvary Chapel, Ontario, what those great things are going to be is in discipleship. Watching believers become stronger within, within our family here. Because that's what Jesus was doing. 
even Jesus had the opportunity, and he took full advantage of it, to disciple these men by walking on water. Do you think that, like, I, I guarantee you, I, I can't guarantee you, but, like, I wonder if the other apostles, like, when every time they went out, they looked at Jesus, like, can I try, you know? If, I, if they're human and they're anything like me, they did, they did it. But, you know, why did you doubt? Why did Peter doubt? Well, because he's a human being. And, and I think that experience in that discipleship of Jesus, between Jesus and him, him saying, why did you doubt? You think his doubt kind of shrunk a little bit after that? You think the other apostles' um, doubt shrunk, especially after they seen Jesus risen from the dead? And you see that, and you see, like, in going back, this is what ministry is. Is, is, is God using you to reach people? But you see, what if Jesus would have been like, oh, my cousin, oh, he's dead. And I just, I can't, you know, no, go, I'll just, I'll just make sure there's no storm. Just go to the other side. I don't want to bother. You're right. Send them to, you know, they can go to in and out or whatever. You know, what if, what if the Lord had done that? You know, would it, would it have been a sin? Well, if that's what God is commanding to, and he didn't, yeah, obviously, but Jesus is God and can't sin. But what if Jesus would have been like, yeah, you know, I can't. Or what if, what if these disciples wanted of? What if Peter would never have asked to walk on water? I think I, I just, that's, that's ministry. That's why we put on the armor of God. This is, you know, we're, we're all fighting something in, your, in our lives. We have to every day get up and offer ourselves as living sacrifices. We have to put on the full armor of God and move in these things because this ministers to people. Think about how many people, you know, reading this has got saved because Peter went out and walked on water. And they read that. Because Jesus, you know, despite his family, a member of his personal family dying, decided to move forward and continue to do what God has commanded him to do. Because Jesus had hope. Because Jesus had faith. Because Jesus had, has love. And so it's, it continues in 34 through 36. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of uh, Genesaret. And when the, the men of the place recognized him, they sent, out all the surra- they sent out into all the surrounding regions, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they, might only touch the, that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Again, Jesus could have been like, you know, I just... My, you know, my tunic's in the, sh- in, the, uh, in the cleaners right now. I want to go take a nap. I want to go get away. And he didn't. Because that's, that's sacrificial love. That's, 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 that's faith personified. That's complete hope. And guys, we can have this because we have, we have the Lord inside of our hearts. And so take, take note of that. Take, Understand, maybe you're, you know, understand every single one of you, I'll just say it, I'll ordain you, ordain you all right now, are called to ministry. You're called to minister to somebody as a born-again believer. But, you know, in, in that, and whoever God's going to give you to disciple, whether it's your son, your daughter, your wife, or whoever else here, or out there, understand that your immediate reaction needs to be prayer in that. You need to draw your strength from the Heavenly Father who hears you. And that's, I think that's the, big, that's the big thing that we need to take away from this, is continue to move in ministry, but don't do it alone. Do it in discipleship. Do it with other people. And do it with the Holy Spirit. Because if you're not doing it the Holy Spirit, the, the real life's going to wear you out. Life is real. Life, life is full of hardships. Death has a sting to it, and it will hurt you. It will keep you down if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life driving you. Call upon the Lord. He cares for you. He wants to see you. That's why he says there's armor. And move forward. Even, you know, even, even when you don't see it, because one day you, you, may, you may think you're working this field and nothing's ever coming up. I must be not doing something right. Or I, I want to give up. But as you, as you keep plowing these fields, you keep spreading these seeds, you keep growing your faith, you keep moving in, I believe absolutely still I believe you're going to see the results here on earth. But even if for some reason you don't, one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to show you all the lives that you touched because you were faithful. God rewards faithfulness. And maybe you'll never see the reward of that in this life, but you will see the reward of that in eternity. 
So let's just keep pressing forward. Let's find people to disciple. Let's keep planting seeds. Let's let, let, if you don't remember anything I've been squawking on about tonight, let your immediate reaction be prayer. Even if it annoys your son. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you once again, God, and we just ask, Lord, that you would, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith tonight. That you would take away our doubt, God. That we would cast our cares upon you, Lord, and you would give us strength, Lord. Lord, I would ask, for me at least, if not everyone here, that you would put stuff in our ways to to, to teach us, Lord, to help us to rely on you so that we could see your goodness, God, and that other people in those trials and in those testings or whatever will see that. God, just, just make us better, Lord. Make us better in your love. Fill us full of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, command us to walk on water. Command us to reach, to reach the lost. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would all stand. Um, I think next week there is a Sunday night, and then after that there is no Sunday night on December 1st.